King Charles III says goodbye to Australia and hello to Samoa for the Commonwealth Summit. Jeremy Vine Show. Ignorance. Is my gender having an identity crisis? What does Venezuela have to do with it? That and much more in Majesty Sussex Report in the news. Well, welcome and thank you for being here. Much appreciated on this October 24th, my birthday. <laughs> oh, I think I just hurt myself. Um, anyways, welcome and thank you for being here. I'm Antonio and um, I wanted to continue on. This is part two of um, part one, which I didn't have enough time to actually um talk a little bit more and and give you my thoughts on the um jeremy vine show um that he did um about colonialism basically and about the um, se um se senator um that was expressing um her, her 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 voice on behalf of her people that she represents in the senate and also um something i've been thinking about a lot is you know is 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 my gender having a crisis or having a nervous breakdown because i don't know what's happening with with guys i don't know what's happening with men i don't know what's happening with their inferiority complex that there seems to be having or this idea that they need to not i, I, sh I, sh I shouldn't use the word need because it, there, it, it isn't a need it's it's more like a want they want to vote for a man that to them signifies strength and 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 power and i don't understand how such stupidity can exist in educated people and in people who look i'm i'm going to talk mostly about minorities okay i'm a minority i'm going to talk black men latino men and all the others right because the ones that i'm looking at may, mainly are black men and latino men because if you're white if you're a white dude you're going to be fine okay you're going to be completely fine or maybe not but that is the demographic that as as long as you 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 you, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> I'm getting already impassioned here. This is just supposed to be the intro. Anyways, I'm going to talk about that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a cautionary tale, and that cautionary tale is Venezuela, and I know something or another about Venezuela. And I've heard a lot of crap being said, um, but I am here to tell you how I see it, how I know it, how I lived it. So let's start. And I want to start with Jeremy Vine. whether the king should apologize for Britain's colonial past, 0207 862 2222. That's because as we've all been waking up here at Channel 5 this morning, we saw footage of a protester shouting in King Charles's face during his official visit to Australia. You committed to against our people. Give us our land back. Give us what you stole from us. Our bones, our skulls, our babies. 
Right. So, I mean, there's a bit of distance between them, but but it was very powerful and the rest of the room was silent. The protester is the Australian Senator Lydia Thorpe. She's a well-known Indigenous campaigner. She is an Aboriginal Australian herself. She's demanding an apology from the King, as you heard, for historic British... Well, we don't make the point, rather like USA, yeah. that there were people there before. A very small number of people there. I, I mean, I believe... I there is a colonial aspect to Australia. Captain Cook arrived in Botany Bay in 1770. That's when he landed. That's when we first set foot on, on Australia. We, I don't mean colonised it. We built Australia. I mean, have you heard Sydney or Perth? These are magnificent, fantastic modern cities. And they were built once settlers from Europe got there and developed the country mm. like many other parts but of the world. And, I, and it's a wonderful country. And I don't know what that woman Lydia's talking about. I mean, you stole our lands. What lands did we steal and who owns them if they were stolen from you? I don't get Michael, it. Struggle for land. Okay, we, we, we will talk about this with, with the, the viewers in just a second. Yeah, oh, by the way, I've got a Harry indoors. Oh, in have you? Okay. But anyway, <laughs> yes, I have. Um, 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 no, I don't think so. It's happened. It really has. Also, you know, I mean, anybody that shouts like that, if you shout at me, I'll shout back. Unfortunately, the king couldn't shout back because it wouldn't be dignified. You, are you talking, you're talking about no, my parents? Happened. No, it's happened. Are you talking and about? Are you talking about the senator? Yeah. Yes, and I'm sick of I'm sick of what's going on. We seem to be an apologetic culture at the moment. Just a digression, but I actually watch a um, a TV, the old sitcoms, and the, and the caption comes up. Sorry if this offends you. It was context at the time. Why are we apologising? It happened, and you know. Well, yeah, well, why are we, we, well, let's bring Michael. Why are we? Enjoying Hello, it? Yvonne. Good morning. Can morning. you hear me? Yeah, we got we've got to that in time, yep. Okay. Basically in history, um go through the empires, the Vikings, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Ottoman, the Islamic Empire, the Russian Empire. You're good. Do you hear any of them apologizing for what they did throughout History. Well, you raise history a very good point, Yvonne. Mm. I don't, I'm trying to think. Wait, wait, because well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, take the Spanish, right? The conquistadors, South America. Unfortunately, that ended up with Incas and people like that who were suffering. But you can't stop the development of the world. My point is that if Captain Cook hadn't gone to Australia, would it still be a country which was only inhabited by Aborigines? If so, it wouldn't be the wonderful modern country it is well, today. Well, well, what I say is. Well, I thought you folks suffered enough. So um, I, 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 when I watched the entire show, I was left speechless, but it also sort of clarify something for me that a lot of these people who go on these shows or invited on these shows, they have a certain tunnel vision and they see the entire world, every issue, every thing through the prism of, of, of that tunnel vision. So when I think of the so-called experts and commentators and reporters and so on, that always are on these shows and they, they, they pretend to know more than they actually do. I think this show really solidify for me how ignorant they are and their level of stupidity and racism is one that it's hard to to really believe that it is displayed so willfully on national television. Amazing. There was one of the callers that said she was watching a sitcom and you know there was a little pop-up that said, if this offends you, we apologize, but we got into context of the time. I think that is quite responsible. Now, I don't know how old this person is. I don't know what, what, what context or anything like that. 
But I'll say this. <clears throat> I don't think that certain words should be eliminated from literature. I don't think in Huckleberry Finn that, that, that they, they, they should take out this word and, and sanitize that word. No, 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 none of that. This is the way the author meant for it to be read. You watch a movie, you watch a sitcom, this is the way it was meant to be seen. I think it's absolutely important to put it within context. So what she's basically saying, if there is a movie or a sitcom she's watching and the N word comes up, it should just, we should just let it fly. I don't think they should beep it. I don't think they should eliminate it because it gives us the context of that time and, and moment in history, right? Because when we sanitize things, people tend to, oh, it wasn't that bad back then. Everything was fine. We already see people who are whitewashing this whole thing about, oh no, slaves, they weren't slaves. It was an apprenticeship program. People actually applied in Africa for it. Yeah, they came here willfully. So if she's criticizing even the notion of, of advising the watcher and said, this is no longer acceptable, but when it was shown, this is the way people spoke about this group or that group or whatever. So I put paper to pen and pen to paper and then to my laptop. And here are some thoughts I've got that maybe Jeremy Vine and Mike and some of the other callers should stop being so ignorant. It's disheartening, though not surprising, to hear the level of ignorance displayed by the panelist, Mike, on the Jeremy Vine show regarding British colonialism in Australia. His statement claiming that there is no colonial aspect to Australia and dismissing Senator Lydia Thorpe's impassioned call for justice as mere protest reflect a fundamental misunderstanding of history and an utter disregard for the traumatic legacy of colonialism. Worse still, it highlights a deeper racism rooted in the inability to empathize with the ongoing suffering of indigenous peoples, which continues to be perpetuated by media figures like Jeremy Vine. Let us begin by addressing the deliberate attempt by Vine to diminish the legis legitimacy of Senator Thorpe's stance by introducing her as just a protester shouting in King Charles' face rather than as a sitting senator in the Australian parliament, Vine shaped the audience perception from the very start. Throp wasn't a random activist. She was an elected representative speaking on behalf of her people. The words she spoke, you committed genocide against our people, were not hyperbole. They were grounded in the lived experiences of her community and the historical reality of British colonialism. This kind of misrepresentation is a tactic used to undermine those who challenge colonial power structures. By positioning Thorpe as other, Vine and the media create an environment where her legitimate demands, such as the return of stolen land and justice for the atrocities committed, are easily dismissed as extremist outbursts. 
this betrayal is not just harmful to Thorp, it reflects a broader dismissal of Indigenous voices in Australia and beyond, contributing to a culture of ignorance that refuses to acknowledge the colonial violence still shaping the lives of Indigenous Australians today. To claim, as Mike did, that there is no colonial aspect to Australia is an act of historical erasure. British colonization of Australia began in 1788 when the first fleet landed in Botany Bay. And with it came the, the systematic destruction of Aboriginal societies. The idea that the Europeans built Australia ignores the brutal reality faced by Indigenous peoples during and after coloni colonization. Aboriginal land was stolen. Entire communities were massacred and a concerted effort was made to erase their culture. What kind of ignorance are we dealing with here? One of the darkest chapters of this history is the Frontier War, a series of violent conflicts between British settlers and Indigenous Australians. These wars often unacknowledged in mainstream history saw the British use extreme violence to dispossess Aboriginal people of their lands. In massacres like Merrill Creek in 1838 where 28 unarmed Aboriginal men, women and children were brutally murdered and the Coniston massacre in 1928 where at least 60 Indigenous people were killed British settlers and the government sanctioned the decimation of indigenous populations. These are just a few examples of the genocidal policies and actions that shaped Australia's colonial history. Yet, Mike, <laughs> the creation of modern cities like Sydney and Perth justifies the horrors of colonization. His argument that colonization was a necessary evil for progress ignores the cost paid by the original inhabitants of the land. It is both ignorant and racist to suggest that the development of infrastructure somehow absolves the colonial powers of their responsibility for the genocide, displacement, and cultural destruction they caused. It also implies that indigenous societies were primitive or incapable of development, which is a deeply colonial mindset. Mike's attempt to compare British colonization in Australia to the Spanish conquest of South America or the treatment of Native Americans in the United States is a classic deflection tactic. Yes, colonization occurred around the globe. And yes, many indigenous people suffered under colonial regimes. But this fact does not absolve Britain of its own crimes in Australia. Each colonial context is unique. And the ongoing effects of British colonization in Australia are still being felt today. Indigenous Australians, for example, continue to suffer from disproportionate levels of poverty, lack of political representation, and systemic racism. The recent failure to pass 
a referendum that would have recognized Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. It's yet another painful reminder of how far the country still has to go in addressing these injustices. The final and perhaps most infuriating argument made, both by Mike and some of the callers, is the suggestion that it happened many years ago and we should just move on. This line of thinking betrays a deep ignorance of the lasting effects of colonialization. The trauma experienced by indigenous Australians is not confined to history books. It is intergenerational passed down from those who were forcibly removed from their land, from those whose children were taken during the stolen generations, and from those who continue to experience discrimination today. Generational trauma manifests in mental health issues, substance abuse, and a host of other social and economic challenges that indigenous communities face. To ask them to move on, move on, without acknowledging or addressing these atrocities and cruelty that was inflicted on these people is both cruel and ignorant and don't get me started with racist what's more the media's role in, per in perpetuating these harmful narratives cannot be ignored Shows like Jeremy Vine often use sensationalism and, 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 and framing tactics to shape public perception in ways that minimize the voices of those who challenge the status quo. In this case, Vine's introduction of Senator Thorpe as a protester and the lack of serious engagement with her demands reflects a broader media culture that refuses to confront uncomfortable truths about colonialism. As a society, we must do better. Britain must do better. The ignorance displayed by Mike a few of the callers on the show is systematic of a larger issue, a failure to reckon with the true legacy of colonialism. We must educate ourselves about the past, not to dwell in guilt, no one is saying that, but to understand the roots of current injustices We must listen to indigenous voices like Senator Thorpe and support their calls for justice. Whether that is through reparations, land rights, or official apologies from colonial powers like Britain. The time for dismissing these demands has long passed. It is not enough to enjoy the benefits of modernity while ignoring the costs paid by others. We must confront our history. Acknowledge its continuous impact and work towards meaningful reconciliation. It's only then, my friends, it's only then we can truly move forward.
Are you voting? Have you voted yet? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What are you what are you voting for? Policies, reasons? I'm really a voting really for the economy. I'm trying to think about the future and what it's looking like from my understanding is looking like the type of class I want to be in that is leaning towards Trump. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't really believe she's gonna cut yeah. the, the student debt or the the country's debt. That that never happens with any president. So her pushing it. So you don't think it happens with any president? No. Well, you know that's not true. Really? Yeah. I mean, like Clinton balanced the budget. And yeah, where is it right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not saying you're saying that it doesn't happen with any president. I'm not saying that it can't be done. And the economy was great no, under Obama. Don't, 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 don't. No, I wouldn't say that. We, did we not go through a recession with? It? Yeah, we came out. He pulled us out of a recession. I'm saying Biden pulled us out of a recession. Well, okay. look at that, man. There you go. We got pulled out of a recession. <laughs> no, if he pulled us out of a recession, you don't like his economic policies. Nah, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, from, I mean, I, I guess it depends on what fee work. Well, I mean, for my dad, my dad has to pay even more in taxes now when, uh, um, with uh, Biden and the trade that he did with Trump. We realize the tax policies we're under now. These, these are Trump's tax policies. They, uh, they uh, expired. one extra shit. I'm cooked down. I think I'm cooked down. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think I'm cooked down. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. No. Yeah. I'm leaning towards Trump. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, are you voting? feeling? Oh, I'm astounded, man. Yeah? Yeah. Are you concerned about the polls? It's tight. It's close. Uh, no, not really. I mean, I look at all the support from the black community, from our HBCUs, our Divine Nine, and I think that we're going to get this thing in the bag. Donald Trump going to McDonald's doesn't mean nothing to me. I mean, he was closed anyways, right? You know, I mean, it went viral. I mean, there are tens of millions of instances where it's being shared, and people are kind of digging it. I mean, yeah, but viral moments don't win politics. That's the thing. I mean, I think when we look at Joe Biden, him doing like what he did in the debate, that was a viral moment. But look at what he's doing now. He's still got this country going. I think it's not that the viral moment is going to get us to win. It's the work behind the scenes that Kamala Harris is doing with us, with the black community, and with all the other people that need to get out the vote, especially our um, the largest voting bloc, which is the undecided voters. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm astounded, man. Yeah, yeah. I plan on doing the Democratic side. It's a whole bunch of. I plan on doing this, 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 this. You've been in the office four years already. Why haven't you done it so far? Thing is, if you were gonna do it, something would have already been put in place towards it. Okay, Not now on, on the Republicans. On the Republican side, same thing. But Republicans tend to get more done than Democrats. What did Mike Pence get done as vice president? He sat back. He, it really wasn't too much that he did either. What did Joe Biden get done as vice president? Honestly and truly, with most of the vice presidents we had, it's just like they're in the background. Okay, so then why are the standards different for Kamala Harris? It's not necessarily that the standards are different, but what I'm saying is you're already in office now. Vice president always has, has a very minimal role, if any. The vice president's to go out and shake hands, go to openings of hospitals, uh, groundbreakings and that kind of thing. It's not really an issue thing. I don't have a different standard for Kamala Harris than you have for all of the male vice presidents. As a man, I find myself questioning whether my gender is facing an identity crisis. This isn't about my personal sense of masculinity, but rather about the disturbing trends I see among young men. Being seduced by authoritarian ideologies that seem hell-bent on suppressing women, 
using them or taking them back to an era where they needed men's approval for everything. This regressive mindset explains the rise of figures like Andrew Tate, who openly preached the abuse uh, and subjugation of women, all in the name of male empowerment. This sort of ideology, instead of uplifting women, want to drag them back down after all the work women have done to advance our society. Women give us life and have always been integral to our existence and progress as a society. Without them, we would not be. So I am deeply confused by this bro culture and the misogynistic podcast that promote toxic masculinity and worship power. It's not just alarming on a social level because it's political. As we approach the next US presidential election, this crisis could have serious implications. Kamala Harris, the Democratic candidate, represents a powerful and competent woman standing in stark contrast to Donald Trump, authoritarian tendencies and past treatment of women. The rising wave of young men idealizing figures like Tate could lead to a pushback against female leadership, influencing votes. This misogynistic culture fosters resentment towards women in power and could sway undecided voters, particularly young men, away from Harris. In a society where power is worshipped and women are viewed as second-class citizens, this dangerous ideology could shape our political future, making it more important than ever to challenge it and stand for equality. When Black and Latino men, those are my concerns because I am that. When Black and Latino men say Trump was better on the economy or what has Kamala Harris done as vice president, they're missing the larger picture. It's not just about how much you pay for an onion or what inflation looks like at the moment. These economic issues are far more complicated than Trump blaming the opposition. And yet people believe, believe it without a question. But when we zoom out, it's clear. Republicans often ride the wave of a good economy left by Democrats. Then, of course, they mess it up with their policies. Then Democrats end up going, do, doing the unpopular things, but necessary in order to fix the economy. And as they fix the economy, then to get voted out once again, and guess who benefit from the policies that Democrats put in in order to recover the economy. They're Republicans. The real problem goes beyond e economic talking points. It's hard to ignore that a man with 34 convictions, SA allegations, and countless failed businesses somehow gets a pass simply because the economy was better? 
The truth is tariffs and tax cuts for the rich don't help everyday Americans. They benefit corporations and wealthy elites, leaving the rest of us to pick, pick up the pieces. Listen, let's be honest here. This isn't just about money, is it? It's a deeper issue at play. The desire for power over women. Figures like Trump and Andrew Tate represent a twisted idea for some men. They think that Tate's idea and Trump's ideal Ideal. They're not going to say it out loud, but they're thinking it. They're drawn to this bro culture. Yeah, bro. That glorifies domination, control, and regression where women should act like their grandmothers. Why can't they be like my grandmother? Why can't they be like my, my mother? submissive, compliant, and dependent on men. The truth is, many of these men aren't just voting for Trump because of the economy. They're voting because he embodies the power they wish they had. But there, but there's the reality. You're not white. Let me say that again. You are not white. The policies Trump promotes won't benefit you. They'll harm you. You're betraying the ancestors who fought and died for your right to sell out your people for a fleeting sense of control or economic gain. It's time to stop playing the fool and recognize the danger of voting for someone whose values are rooted in oppression and division. Wake up, black young men, black young Latino men, wake up. What is wrong with you? Know your history. Why are you taking every single word that this charlatan says to you? He represents everything our ancestors have fought against. Whips, scars on their bodies, cracked skulls. Dogs were let out to bite them. For you to have the damn privilege to vote, and you walk in there with your nonsense and vote against everything they fought for with their blood. You are a clown. Wake up and stop thinking about just yourself. <laughs>
you would think that based on what <laughs> the things I've talked about today is they're all so heavy. Um, you wouldn't know it was my birthday. <laughs> you would think I would be talking about more light weight things and not so heavy and so serious. But I guess, listen, I am I'm I'm interested in 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 social movements, in in democracy, elections, and people, in um, social justice, and all of that. So just wanted to bring this to you folks, um, just to have that conversation and for you to, you know, um, give you some thoughts as to where my head is in regards to all of this. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Venezuela and sort of as a cautionary tale in regards to the elections in, in the U.S. And Venezuela is used often as an example by the Republicans to say that if you elect a Democrat with their socialist, this and agenda and whatever, that the country will become like a Venezuela. Now, the story as it's told by Republicans, it's erroneous. It's actually wrong. They tell the story in order to benefit them, not the truth. So I, let, me, let me say this. Venezuela was one of the longest running consecutive democracies in South America. Um, it's rich in oil. It has the largest oil reserves in the world. Um, um, above Saudi Arabia, and as I said, enjoyed a de de democracy for a very long time and one of the richest countries in South America. There were many people that immigrated or came to Venezuela to, to make their fortunes and stuff because the economy and all of that did very well because it was a very, it's still, it's a very oil-based economy. So when, when oil is, is, is expensive, right, the country racks in a, a lot of money, a lot of revenue. But when it's not, oil is not doing well, then it's not that great, right? So with that said, in, and, and remember, the institutions, also democratic institutions, very stable, the, the Supreme Court, all of that, it's a functioning democracy. In 1992, Army Pirate Troop Commander Lieutenant Coronel Chavez, Hugo Chavez, leads a botch um, coup d'etat against President Carlos Andres Perez. He faces possible 30-year term prison, but the case never goes to trial. Military officers with close ties to Chavez make a second attempt for a coup, which was squashed. So they were all put in jail. So after two, two years in jail and awaiting trial, the new president, President Rafael Caldera, dismisses the charges on condition that Chavez and these other military people do not go back to the military. So they, they must retire. Fine. Chavez leaves Venezuela and goes to Cuba. Whatever his conversation is with Fidel Castro, they should know. He comes back to Venezuela and runs for the presidency. And his rhetoric is pretty similar to Trump's, right? And he sells people and all this stuff. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so on. He wins. And believe it or not, hours after he's sworn in, he decrees a referendum on whether to rewrite the constitution or not. So he completely throws the constitution out and decides we're going to write a new constitution because he kept telling his people, people who voted for him, oh, the constitution doesn't benefit you. We're going to do that. So he did, he did it. And in the referendum, he won, obviously, because everyone who voted for him voted for a new constitution. So the new constitution now completely was in his favor. They, they got rid of a whole bunch of things that, 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 that would safeguard the democracy. Now the president was able to stay in power longer. So he could stay in power now 13 years plus. And in the Constitutional um, Assembly, he had 122 seats out of 128. So complete control 
of that um, uh, level of government. Then he started to shut down radio stations and TV stations, TV channels, if they said anything he didn't like. If they said something about him he didn't like it, he shut them down. He, they started to persecute journalists. They started to put um, people of, of the opposition in jail, right? Does this sound familiar? Does this start to sound familiar? So a lot of now cases were being brought up in, um, in the judicial system because at least we're like one, one branch is still working. He shuts it down. Under the, 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 the disguise of that, the, the, the Supreme Court is basically corrupt. And now that they, there's a new constitution, there's sweeping powers now that he's got. So he shuts that down, fires everyone, and he hires his cronies, people that will just rubber stamp whatever he says, whatever he does. Now, you take a country like that, you wipe out all the, all the democratic institutions using democratic means to do it, right? He did everything he did. He used democratic means in order to do it. You see, authoritarian governments, that's what they do. They use the, 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 the ways of democracy and the institutions in order to rubber stamp now their authoritarianism and change things around to benefit them and their friends. Now, the, the, the economy was still going okay because oil prices were, was pretty high. So there were some social programs that he was putting in place in order to like, you know, keep some of his promises to the masses. Oil prices, oil prices drop. And what he does, because he, he can't explain why to his people, because they want simple answers. They, they don't want complex answers to anything. They want simple answers. Oh, you don't, you, do, you don't have a job? Blame an immigrant, right? That's that sort of thing. We, we have seen the story. We've heard the story before. So he basically just says, yeah, what has happened is that everyone at PDVSA, PDVSA is the oil company, the, 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 the most well-run institution in Venezuela. He goes, everyone there, they're, they're from the past. They're corrupt. It's, it's, that's the why that, that um, they, they're stealing the money from, from um, the oil. And he fires close to 15,000 people, all of them, the executives, everyone. Who does he put in power? His friends. His friends that don't know I, <laughs> one thing about running an oil company. They run the oil company almost to the ground. There is like infrastructure that needs to be repaired. There's like technology that needs to be updated. It's just a disaster. And oil prices keep plummeting. So crime increases in the country. He decides to get like a par paramilitary service, people, like, like literally the things that Trump has talked about. So now you can't even say anything because you're worried if your neighbor is a Chavez supporter, and they're gonna like, you know, call call on you if you say anything bad about Chavez. So I'm using that example as a cautionary tale because what Chavez implemented in Venezuela is not socialism. Okay, it's not socialism. What he did was a form of communism and fascism. So it's fascism and communism together, not socialism. Not what he did, that's not socialism at all. So when you hear Republicans say, oh, that, no, 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 it's a lie. He got in there and by the means of democratic means, he changed everything. Right now, Trump has the Supreme Court, right? If he wins the Senate and the House and all of that, that there's nothing stopping him to do the things that he wants to do, to become an autocrat. And he's gonna do it. He is going to do it. This, if there's one thing with the Republicans, they tell you what they're going to do. They're like, we're gonna do this and they do it. They absolutely do it. It may take them time, but they do it and they all fall in line. Because look, man, that, that man has called people's wives ugly. He's called them names. 
And all of them just fall in line behind him. Like, it's, it's amazing. Okay, so that's, that's my cautionary tale. Done. My beautiful people, thank you for still being here. Do remember to subscribe if you are new around and you haven't subscribed yet. We'll absolutely appreciate it. Um, if you are a subscriber, please turn on your notification so that you will know when a new episode has been uploaded. It's the best way to actually get an alert. When it works, of course, because sometimes it doesn't. And please click on the like um, emoji. That would be the emoji with the thumb up um, that you see. Just click on it and share this episode or any other if you think someone else would enjoy it or is like-minded and would like to join our awesome community here. Of course, do comment. I read all of your comments. I appreciate them. For anyone who's new, who wants to leave a comment, don't be nasty. There's enough issues in the world. Just be kind, okay? Thank you very much. A big thank you to each and every one of you who took the time to wish me happy birthday. I appreciate that. Thank you very, very, very much from the bottom of my heart. I am absolutely blessed to have this incredible support from each and every one of you. Thank you so very much. I'm, I appreciate it. Thank you. TCC Sun, Matilda, Connie, Jennifer, Jean, Joan, Marsha, thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kindness and your generosity. Thank you. Um, Joan and Marsha, thank you for that special email that you um, sent. I fully enjoyed it. Uh, Marsha loved the song. Um, got me a little bit, um, you know, you know what I mean. Got me a little bit in my in my feelings. And um, Joan, I would say that um, most of, you know, what is there is kind of true. But a lot of the stuff that is not, you know, too great to have, I tend to suppress that kind of um, way of being. You know what I mean. Anyways, thank you so very much. Um, love you all. Thank you for making me feel quite special. Thank you. <laughs>